Good day, everyone. Welcome to our fourth webinar. The theme is Intellectual Property Rights for Startups, How to Protect Trademark and Copyright in the Global Context. On this webinar, we'll discuss steps that startups going to the US market and looking at uh, international markets need to take in order to protect their own IP and make sure they're not infringing other companies' IP. Uh, this will be a very interactive session, so we really encourage all of your questions. And thank you all who sent questions to us. Uh, I'd like to introduce our expert speaker today, Louis Levy. He's an attorney at Bell's Cats LLC, a full service IP law firm. He has extensive experience advising clients in the areas of trademark, copyright, unfair competition, publicity rights, e commerce, data privacy, computer security and online and mobile advertising. Mr. Levy is a frequent speaker in uh, the Washington DC startup scene, and he gives many talks on IP aspects of startup founding and management. And in a previous life, Lewis also explored uh, the bounds of Slavic literature. So he has a strong interest and experience in Eastern Europe. So we welcome you and um, uh, welcome your thoughts. Well, thanks very much. Uh, it's it's very good to speak to uh, speak to all of you. I appreciate the opportunity. Um, uh, just for clarification, my former life I was it was Russian and Eastern European literature. Um, so I did a lot of work in in, uh, in in Russian literature, and I studied actually studied in in Petersburg many many years ago, thirty years ago. Um, as a foreign as a foreign student there, uh, and so it's a really very unique opportunity for me to sit and talk with all of you, and I do want to encourage you to feel free to interrupt with questions, uh, and let's make this as interactive as possible, uh, so so you get the most out of it. Um, I put my email there also. If you have follow up questions, I encourage you to contact me. I'm I'm very happy to do that, uh, and um, with that, I'll just head into this. Um, Basically, I, I wanted to start with just some preliminaries on trademark basics, and, and I'm going to get into copyrights, and, and oh, I know there's a lot of interest there uh, on patents and patent protection, which I'm going to get to also. Um, and I want to, uh, you know, so I want you all to know what's coming in this. Uh, and I'll try to go through, I think most of you are fairly well informed on the basics of trademark law. But just to be clear, in the U.S., we've been... Uh, Moving forward, it's you know any word, name, symbol, or device uh, used to distinguish a good or a service of one person from the goods of another. Um, and then I have a bunch of examples here. These these things you know. Uh, the purpose of trademark law it's actually twofold. One is consumer protection. You want consumers want assurance that what they're getting is the real item. So this plays out you know in you know for not just in electronics but particularly in drugs in in you know in pharmaceuticals where you get a, a prescription for say you know for for xanax or something you want to know you're actually getting xanax and not something else you so you want to have uh you want to protect the consumers from from uh from uh having to buy products that are of lesser quality than what they expect it also protects trademark owners because uh, they've invested a lot in their marks. And I've given you a couple of examples here. You know, Starbucks, of course, everybody knows Starbucks. Um, and there are a lot of the, the marks surrounding the Starbucks logo are marks that, you know, have, have come, close to, uh, come close to infringing or have been certainly challenged. Um, the second, below that, the two watches, uh, we have uh, on the left a, an infringing watch. Swiss International developed a watch which uh, was infringed the design of this watch on the right. Now, you look at it and you say, well, I don't see it's infringing because the face is different. But what's infringing there is that uh, six-sided bezel around the, around the clock, around the watch face, and the placement of the screws. And there was also evidence to show that the Swiss International was actually trying to copy the Rola, this Audemars Piquet, which is a very high-end watch. They lost that. It was a trade dress issue. Um, Sky Sky Drive was a, a case dealing with a palming off encounter. Or was a case dealing with uh, 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 Microsoft Microsoft, uh, which now, they now call it OneDrive, but they had initially called it Sky Drive and Sky Broadcasting, of course, from England, which you, you may uh, you may know, uh, challenged them on it, and they had to change to OneDrive, and that's how we got OneDrive. Um, moving forward, there are lots of different trademark types. Now I know uh, from what uh, from what uh, 
uh, Adrian and uh, Yvonne have told me that there's probably not too much concern out there for certification marks, collective marks, and things like that. But there are different kinds of trademarks. You know, they're, they're in, technically, there's a trademark for a good or ser- a good. There's a service mark for a service. They're generally referred collectively to as trademarks. There are certification marks where you want the you you want to show that you've been approved by someone. Uh, you know, we have the American Health Association. In the U.S., it's Underwriters Laboratories, UL. It's, uh, it, if it's UL certified, that means it's been uh, inspected and the product, you, this covers a wide, wide range of products from, from just mechanical things to electronics things to ladders. Uh, if it's UL certified, that means that there's, it's met certain criteria for safety. Um, there's uh, also collective marks, you know, you show something's been uh, you know, been uh, from a particular area like Idaho preferred is a real Idaho potato, things like that. Um, you, I suspect most of you are familiar with that. Trademark formats is actually very interesting, and I know the U.S. has been a bit um, a bit ahead in, uh, on what we consider protectable. But you know, it's not just words, letters, and designs. I mean, you know, it's trade dress. The uh, have the picture there of that. That's an Apple Store. The Apple Store. That trade dress is actually registered in uh, with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. And if another company were to come along, and if Microsoft, say, was to open up a set of stores imitating that design, they would be infringing Apple's mark. Um, the beer can. Uh, it's one of my favorite beers, and which is why I used it. But the Sapporo can. When I used to live in Japan, I spent four years there. And I used to actually meet with the guys from Sapporo fairly frequently and back in the 90s. And they had asked me about this can. And this can, they wanted to protect this tapered, very gently tapered can. You've probably seen it. Um, and it, it is, in fact, registered as a trademark and protectable. Um, sound is registered. You know, sound is registrable. Certain sound marks. Uh, Microsoft's, there are a bunch of them. I mean, if you think of what sound your computer makes when, if you have Microsoft, when it turns on, uh, the uh, uh, Deutsche Telekom, or uh, I think it's Deutsche Telekom. Uh, they have the um, a five a five uh, note uh, do, 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 which uh, sounds much better when they do it. But it uh, that that's a protectable trademark. Uh, Tarzan's and this is what I have. This is uh, the Microsoft registration I have for you. <clears throat> is you know when they describe it, but it, you know you you know it. It can it's that swoosh sound that whoosh. And then there's a low pitch sound of a bubble and a bubble pop is heard. You know, you've all heard it when you turn on your machines. Deutsche Telekom, you know, they describe them. There's also one for, uh, if you know, remember Tarzan's Yell. If you're familiar with those old movies, um, uh, with, uh, with, uh, which I will not imitate for you. But it's, you know, this very loud, you know, loud yell. And it's sort of a call in the jungle. But there's a written description of it, which is just, you know, uh, it uh, could bore you to tears, but it, uh, it, as exciting as that yell is, the written description is that boring. But it is, in fact, a registered trademark. Textures are also protectable. You know, the velvet, the mar- a mark can consist of a velvet textured covering on the surface of a wine bottle. That's a protected trademark. Smell, fragrances, this is all protectable. It's a wide range of things. Um, and you need to be mindful of that, of what you, you, know, what you might think of as a, you know, just a drawing or design. It's protectable. Um, Moving forward a little bit, the app in uh, in the U.S. and I suspect this is fairly universal, but in the U.S. We, we, the, the, case, the case law talks about this what they call a taxonomy of distinctiveness. It's what you what makes a mark distinctive. And in here, an Apple is a great example because Apple for computers, of course, is very arbitrary. Who would have thought to name a computer Apple? There's a design. Apple is a registered trademark, and Apple for a fruit, of course, is not. It's generic. You can't, you can't start selling apples and say, I want to be the only guy who can use the word apple. A descriptive mark is a touch above generic. It generally describes a feature function or characteristic of the product. Um, but it, uh, it, it's, uh, you, you don't, again, you don't want to deprive the public of being able to use the words. But with descriptive marks, if you can show that you've used it for several years and that, it's, that the, the uh, the public has come to recognize it as a as a trademark. Then there's a, a section in the law which allows you to do that. So descriptive marks can work, but you have to be willing to sort of market them and promote them aggressively. And over time, you know, you'll you'll be able to get uh, to register the trademark. And as a matter of law, even if it's not registered, if you can show that the public recognizes it, you'll be able to protect it. 
suggestive is a bit, um, you know, is a is the, a lot of case law about the distinctive between the two, but suggestive marks really don't say anything specific about a product. They might come close, but they don't say anything specific. And fanciful and arbitrary are really two 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 iterations of the same concept. But something that's fanciful is just a um, uh, you know a trademark that is you know is applied to a product in a kind of a you know a a fanciful way just a, and it gets very close to being arbitrary like apple but you know if something are fanciful arbitrary it's protectable suggestive should be descriptive you may need more uh you need to show that the public actually knows and recognizes the mark generic marks are not protectable at all to give you an example, Bayer Aspirin, which I suspect you know, most of you know the German pharmaceutical company Bayer, they had trademarked the word aspirin back in the 20s, but it became the generic word for that kind of product. But I think it's acetyl, uh, uh, there's, I forget the pharmaceutical name for it, but it's a certain compound. And uh, the aspirin eventually became generic and they lost the trademark in it. Um, one thing I do want to tell you is when you're choosing marks, Stay away from famous marks. Stay away from marks when you think, hey, I want something like Microsoft. You know, you don't want to say, okay, I'll call it, you know, Macrosoft. Or you don't want to do, do anything like that because there's a, a, a the law, A, as a matter of infringement, the law will nail you. But there's also a, se a, a second concept of trademark dilution, where even if you're not in the same field, they can still get you. If you have a famous, if you're trying to use a famous mark or something like a famous mark, that dilutes the, dilutes the distinctiveness of the famous mark. Uh, you just want to stay away from that. Um, talking a little bit about infringement here, uh, you have, you know, there's this trinity sight, sound, meaning. Uh, and, you know, I have the statutes and the sections of the law there that apply. Uh, but it's not just the similarity of the marks themselves. It goes to the similarity of the goods the, uh, per se. The, the, uh, and they don't have to be identical, by the way. They have to be related. So, for instance, wine is related to beer. Restaurant services can be related to, to liquor. Uh, there are, it's not obvious. And so you have to, and you have to think about that when, you, when you're choosing your trademarks. Um, it also goes to how they're marketed. It's what we call the similarity of trade, trade channels, um, the conditions under which a buyer will encounter the mark. Uh, fame of the prior mark is very important. Um, if there's a lot of marks where certain terms are used very commonly in marks, and if and then if you have a, a what they call a uh, the common uh, crowded, it's called a crowded field. If if you have a crowded field of marks with people using the term um, American councils, say uh, anyone who just adds something to it, you know, is the American councils for the environment. Well, that's you know you're going to be that's going to be okay because a lot of other American councils for a lot of other things. Um, so, but that's an issue you want to think about when you're searching for a mark. Another question there is, um, act, is there actual confusion? You know, it, would people actually be confused by it when they're looking at infringement cases? Sometimes one of the determining factors is two marks are out there, they're coexisting and no one has ever confused them. Well, if no one's ever confused them, that sort of undercuts any argument that there's an infringement. And that's something that people will look at, the courts will look at very, very carefully. And that feeds into coexistence, of course. Um, moving forward, and this is a case, just to give you an example, this is a case I worked on a uh, long time ago, in, back in the, uh, geez, in the early 2000s. Um, and the, this is a case, I don't know if you know YKK, it's a Japanese manufacturer of zippers. It's the world's largest manufacturer of zipper. I would imagine that if all of you were to examine your zippers, uh, a good many of you would find the YKK logo on it. Um, and it's, it's a big company. They also design, you know, doors and architectural stuff. Very cool company. And we found this Korean company that was using YPP. And they'd also copied a bunch of brochures and things like that and some other secondary trademarks. Um, they wouldn't, they, they uh, got rid of, and they, they got rid of the brochures. They stopped doing that right away. But they insisted on keeping YPP. Well, we went through this whole case with them where and we're in the U.S., by the way, you know, U.S. litigation, which I really didn't intend to talk about here, but U.S. litigation, even in the trademark opposition cancellation context, can be very onerous. So you have to think, care. you know, it's not like Europe. It's not like other countries. We have discovery. We force people to testify. We have access to documents. Courts can, courts can do that as a matter of our civil rules. It gets very onerous. 
Um, in this case, in the course of discovery, we found a trademark search report that they had done in a, for, from a marketing company, and they wanted to use YPP. They had always wanted to use YPP. The, the market, their marketing company said, don't do it. They did it anyway. That was a smoking gun. We won this case on the summary judgment motion. Uh, but it was, you know, they, they came close. It's not the identical mark, YPP, but it was YKK. You know, it was close enough to YKK, and the court granted the motion. And, they, you know, they had to pay damages and had to rebrand and, you know, do. I don't even know. There's a company called Jungwoo Zipper. I don't even know where they are now. Um, there's also different types of infringement. This might be a little bit too much in the weeds, but you know, you have direct infringement, which is YKK. You have reverse infringement where a new user can overwhelm an, uh, a, a junior user. So this is a while, case a while back there when the, um, some of you may recognize the Ford Mustang. It's kind of a classic 1970s, you know, car made by Ford. People love them, people collect them, people trade them with friends. Um, before there was a Mustang sports car, there was a Mustang camper. And so on the left, you could see that little camper uh, on, on the back of that truck. Um, and they, of course, tried to sue Ford. Well, they lost because, you know, the court said there's really no chance that anyone would confuse the two things. Um, and, but that's the, what they call reverse infringement. There's also, and more importantly, in the software context, uh, there's some, and, and are the initial, initial interest confusion and also contributory infringement. Contributory infringement goes to whether, it, it, when you're posting a website, for instance, if you're an eBay, or you're a, you're a YouTube, are you, um, are, you, uh, are you you providing a venue for other people to sell infringing marks? And it goes to just old case law if you, of, of a guy who owned a building and he knew that there was a, a, a prostitution ring operating in, uh, operating in the building and he just continued to collect rent. And the courts found that he was contributorily liable because although he wasn't running that business, he wasn't running the prostitution business. He was benefiting from it, and he knew about it. Contributory infringement is the same concept. If you are providing a venue, say a flea market, you know, where you're just letting people sell infringing products from your property, and you're collecting revenue from it, that could be liability for you. And on, in the online context, that's particularly important. And so I don't know how many of you operate that kind of business in a software, you know, if you're selling things off your website or, you know, letting people trade things on your websites, that's something to consider. Um, initial interest confusion really goes to the early days of the internet and using uh, using um, uh, using meta tags in in your in your codes. Where a lot of people would put meta tags. If you were say Apple, you would put Microsoft in your meta tags, so people looking for Apple would come to you. You know, in the, in the Google hits that came up and things like that. Um, and that was found to cause initial interest confusion, meaning that in the analogy, which everyone always said, is if you're driving along a highway and you see a big sign up in the air that says McDonald's, and you say, yeah, I feel like McDonald's, and then you go to the sign and you get there and there's actually a, another restaurant, you know, not a McDonald's, a Burger King or, or some other, other restaurant under, underneath that sign. You're not confused, you know you're going to Burger King, but that sign was the initial interest confusion that got you there, and maybe it's late and maybe you'll eat there anyway. So it's, uh, but that's a concept in US law. Uh, moving forward, and I talked about it briefly, but it, it's trademark dilution, which was a law passed in 1996, and it, it goes to, you don't have to have a likelihood of confusion. You don't have to have the goods, the goods or services don't have to be related. The only thing that's important is whether the mark, the plaintiff's mark, the complainant's mark is famous. Uh, and there's a very high threshold for fame, but if you're truly famous, then you can argue that the, the defendant's use of the mark either, tarn either blurs the distinctiveness of your mark, makes your mark less distinctive, or tarnishes. And this is particularly important, tarnishment being, you know, if someone's using it for pornography, uh, which happens a lot. It, had, it, it seems like it happened a lot more, you know, 10 years ago or so. But when the internet, people would just take a trademark and then link it to a porn site, and porn drives the net, uh, and a lot of the finances from it. So that was very big money for them. Um, but that was tarnishment, and you could get get you could if you could find the if you could find the actor, if you could find the defendant, you could go after him under under a tarnishment theory. One of the better cases, uh, and we actually made it to the U.S. Supreme Court uh, back in 2003, was this Mosley v. Victoria's Secret catalog. Mo uh, uh, the Mosleys were this little couple in I believe in Virginia, Southern Virginia or West Virginia, and they had an adult toy store, you know, an, an adult shop, lingerie, sex toys 
things of that nature. And they called it Victor's Little Secret because the guy's name was Victor, Victor Mosley. And he called it Victor's Little Secret. And this is, of course, after Victoria's Secret was, the, the fashion company was out there. And Victoria's Secret, the fashion company, sold them. And, uh, or rather sued them on a trademark dilution theory. And it went all the way up to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court ruled in favor of Victor's Little Secret and didn't find dilution in part because of the way the statute was written. The statute originally called for actual dilution and uh, they could find no actual dilution. So the court ruled in favor of Victor's Little Secret. He had a whole army of pro bono lawyers, a lot of academics who helped him on this. Um, the, the, of course, Congress, uh, being true to high principle, then revised the law to say a likelihood of dilution, which if had that been the law, Victor's Little Secret would have lost, but that was after their decision. But this is a great case. Um, and uh, for just for its amusement factor, if no, no other. Uh, this goes down to the practical side of this. When you're looking to launch in the U.S., when you're looking to start a market and a business in the U.S., it's really important to search, um, to do a, a, as full a comprehensive search as you can. You could search the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. That's your first stop. And that tells you what marks are registered federally. But uh, that, and I, I listed there the test2.uspto.gov is where you go to, to it's, the, it's the direct route in, as opposed to just going to the uspto.gov homepage and then trying to figure out where the search, uh, the search button is. Just use this, test2.uspto.gov. And that's your first stop. And you, you want to search um, the identical mark. You could search using a wild card and uh, uh, an asterisk after you know some some core core portion of your mark to see if there are other things out there. Um, but that's a way to search to see if anything uh, immediately comes out of you that's federally registered. But in the U.S., you have to recognize that trademarks trademark rights are not created through registration; they're created through use. And so, and there are other, there are other ways, uh, you know, there are other, so therefore that requires you really to search in a couple of different ways. You can do a search of state records. Now, there are databases, you know, I've paid subscription services. I use, I use Core Search, which searches state records, but truthfully, they're not, they're not updated all that, uh, all that frequently. So, uh, you, the what you get out of the paid services sometimes isn't isn't up to date, so you have to go right into the state websites. Most of them offer trademark searches. Some of them don't. Some of them make it difficult. Michigan just provides a list of a PDF list of all their registered trademarks. Um, but you, you know, and but to get a state trademark, uh, you have to have use of the mark. So that tells you what's out there. But also just search the web. Um, the web, you know, if you if you do a good search of the web. You can generally find stuff that's out there uh, that's identical to yours. Um, and I, I do want to, and, and you also have to avoid certain fallacies. I mean, a common word, if you're using a common word and you say, oh, it's a common word. Well, it may be a common word in a lot of contexts and in, just in, in, you know, standard English or even standard Russian, which is something else I, I, I need to talk to you about. But, uh, but the, uh, just because it's a common word doesn't mean it's not, it's not protectable. And you have to think about that. That's why I always, it really makes sense to get someone who does this for a living to at least give you a, you know, give you a sense of the legal aspects of this, the search results. And it's, I encourage you to do that um, if you can. Now, one thing, you know, I mentioned, you know, it's you know, some words, there's a, a doctrine in U.S. trademark law called the doctrine of foreign equivalence. What that means is that a trademark, uh, if you have a trademark in a foreign language, uh, that's um, uh, you, the U.S. Trademark Office, in order to register it, will translate it into English before considering whether, you know, when considering whether it's descriptive or confusing or similar or something like that. So if you have a mark, um, one of the famous cases is a case, um, a restaurant called La Loupe, L-U-P-E, which I think is French for wolf. Of course, there was a wolf restaurant in the U.S. that was registered. That was found confusingly similar. Um, I had a mark uh, a long time ago when I was first starting up, and it was a Japanese trademark, uh, Kibun, which sell, if any of you are familiar with Japan or Japanese food and food, the, the food industry, there's a, fa a very famous brand called Kibun, K-I-B-U-N. Um, and Kibun, one translation of Kibun is, and if you just do a translation on 
Google Translate or something, you'll see it says feeling, you know, the word feeling, F-E-E-L-I-N-G, chustva paruski, I think. And then, uh, but that's only, but if you look at in Japan, Japanese being what it is, it's written in the, the kanji, the ideographs, the Chinese ideographs. The word, the kibun, although it's pronounced kibun, it actually was the name of the guy's wife and also a reference to an old Ch uh, Japanese feudal domain had nothing to do with kibun, the way the kanji for ki the, J the Chinese ideographs used for the word feeling. And so, but we have to go through this with PTL, we finally won. But this doctrine can be a real pain and it doesn't make sense, and there's been a lot of case law criticizing it, but it can be a real pain. So you have to think about, if you're gonna do a, a trademark in, in uh, you're gonna use a Russian term, or you know, or, you know, a Slavic term, you have to think about what it means and how it would tra translate in English and be prepared to deal with that question. Um, one thing about searches is you have to know, no matter how thorough you are, and you can get a comprehensive search from Thompson CompuMark or Core Search and pay 700 or 800 bucks, or a thousand bucks for them, but no search is perfect. And those searches cover a broad range of sources, but again, no search is perfect. But doing the search can shield you from, uh, they show that you've been duly diligent, they show that you were trying to search and figure out what was out there. And so if someone says, and in the US, in the US, if you're shown to willfully infringe, if you're shown to be intentional uh, about your infringement, that you wanted to infringe, say YKK, or something else like, you know, or Microsoft or something else. If they have proof of that, they can, they can treble your damage. They can, the court can say, okay, maybe the damages were only $50,000, but now you have to pay 150 and, you know, $150,000. If you can show that you really did try to, you know, try to do a search, that would really deflect, help deflect a claim of willfulness. And that's important. Um, and again, I always leave people with this. It costs less to search properly than, uh, than to be sued, and especially in the U.S. Because okay? lawsuits in the U.S. are not, just not fun. They're ridiculously expensive, and they take your time and take your energy. Um, and it's really an issue. Uh, it's, it's, and so I encourage people to make sure they do this properly when they're starting out. Um, trademark registration. There is a, a, an advantage to it. It gives you, is there, uh, they're, they, again, they don't create the right, but they provide a government seal. Of, it, it, they tell you that the mark is valid. They, they give you, uh, in a court, they give you what we call evidentiary presumptions. They're uh, presumptions and evidence that your mark is valid and that you own it. They also provide uh, constructive notice to the whole country. And, well, and you know, in its territories, in Guam and Puerto Rico and, people, and, and other, other areas, that the that you have your rights that you're claiming that you have um you can also file in the in europe you don't have a you and mostly uh you don't have a use requirement when you get a registration uh in in the u.s law when it was modified back in the um i guess in the 80s they they finally put in an intent to use application you could file on the basis of an intent to use in the u.s and when you do that you the application will go through but rather than be registered, the mark will be allowed. You then have to submit a statement of use once your mark commences use in the U.S., uh, once you begin using your mark in the U.S. But now the case law has gotten a little bit, um, made it a little bit harder. You can't just say, oh, I have an intent to use just because you had an idea. You have to actually be able to document somewhere, I have a business plan and I want to use this mark and I'm going to spend the next six months developing the idea. I mean, you have to have, be, you can, if in, you always have to have a view toward being in court and what evidence you might have to show or being in an opposition or a cancellation proceeding. And so it's important to get your documents in order so you know that if you're going to use a mark, you have to have some documentation showing that you in fact were intending to use it. Um, and as you know, registration is based on a foreign registration, which you don't have to show use for the first five years. You do after, in between the fifth and sixth anniversary, you have to provide evidence of use. But if you have a registration in, 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 in Russia, the Ukraine, or you know, any, any place else, most everywhere, there are only a few countries that uh, don't, uh, aren't part of that treaty, the, uh, the, I think it's the Paris Treaty, you can get a uh, registration based on a foreign registration. And an extension of that, of course, is the Madrid Protocol, which provides for your registration in your home country. You can extend that through the World Intellectual Property Office, will administer for you the filing of applications, <clears throat> the filing of applications in other countries and based on your home country application. Uh, and that uh, makes it a little bit cheaper in the initial stages, 
but then you have to you still have to do all the maintenance and things like that centrally um you can like i said and this doesn't apply to you guys so much but you can um ben you you can register in the states individually sometimes in cases and i had a case with a software company a swedish software company where we had to register we had a federal trademark but to file a suit we were suing in oregon and we were going to sue under uh, not only federal statutes but state law statutes in order to sue under state law statutes we had to have a state registration so we had to get an oregon state registration for my client's mark um so there there are certain certain times when a state registration is useful and remember also, you have common law rights. Once you start using a mark in the US, you have common law rights to it. They're limited in geographic scope, limited, you know, uh, limited in, in uh, just how much protection they can get. But the bottom line is the federal law recognizes unregistered common law rights. And that's important for you to keep in mind. Um, moving forward, when you, know, you register, I give you a website there that it's through TEAS, uh, with the, it's, it's a USPTO website, but the, the webpage is called TEAS, the Electronic Application System. Uh, and there you provide your owner name address. It's fairly straightforward. You have to provide your country formation, your entity type in Russian, for instance, if you're uh, uh, the Aksionirnaya Obchistva or something like that. And the, tra and the trademark does provide, if you say you're a foreign company, there's a little drop down box which lists, you know, uh, over a hundred different kinds of, of foreign companies from all over the world, uh, and you could you could find that one uh, in that list. Um, if it's a drawing mark or design mark or a stylized wording, you want to provide a drawing of the mark. I encourage people to do it in black and white because that covers all color formats. Of course, if you're interested in protecting certain color combinations, you want to register in color. Um, you want to list the goods and services. In the USPTO, unlike Europe uh, and uh, frankly a lot of other countries, uh, the US requires specificity um, with, the, with the identification of goods and services. So you can't just say software. You have to say software for use in the field of financial accounting or so, you know, uh, you saw computer software for creating, editing music and sounds would be sufficient, but you have to be specific. Uh, you can't just say software. The general, what they call a class heading, there are classes under the NIS, the, they're called the NIS classification system, but there are 45 classes. <clears throat> you can't just use the class heading. You have to be specific. And the PTO, truthfully, the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office could drive you nuts and be sometimes really stupid about that. But it, uh, you, you, have to, um, uh, you have to bear that in mind when you're, when you're trying to register in the U.S. Uh, you want to identify your basis of the application, which is to say an intent to use use in commerce, a foreign registration. Uh, you have to sign the declaration and then you file it. Uh, the official filing fee now is 225. The filing fees just went up. The uh, the lower fees for if you if you're willing to uh, commit to doing everything electronically are 225 to 275. Um, uh, if you if you're not willing to commit to doing that, it's a 400. dollars Other fees also went up. You know. Uh, as well, including the fees to file an opposition, fees for file renewing and things like that, but not by an awful lot, but by the first time they've gone up in, honestly, got in years. They, it's, it's, uh, they hadn't raised them in a long time. Um, and I, I mentioned to you the Madrid Protocol, but that's, that's uh, essentially based on a foreign registration. How long does that process take? The, the process will take nine, uh, if everything goes well and nothing's cited against you, and you, uh, you, the process could take you know, nine months to seven to nine months from the time you file the application to the time it's actually registered, um, if you've, especially if you're filing on the basis of use. If you're filing on the basis of an intent to use, you can have an allowance in, you know, in seven to nine months. And sometimes they're, early, sometimes, sometimes they're amazingly fast. But then you have to file a statement of use, which then extends the process, and that, that then then it becomes uh, it becomes uh, it, it's up to you. You know, the quicker you file your statement of use, the quicker you get the registration. If you get small, sometimes you get small technical office actions. For instance, if it's a minor amendment to the identification of goods, or if it's a minor amendment, you have to. If for a design mark, you have to put a description of the mark. The mark consists of a circular design with stylized wording and. It, they can get very, they're dry, but you have to give them a, a, good, a good description of the mark. Sometimes a PTO will, will require a different, a revised description, but that all can be taken care of. I know as a practitioner, I call the examiner or I just simply file a very quick response to that and just tell them, yes, that's fine. And they go ahead. Sometimes they require a disclaimer. If there's a, a disclaimer being, if you have a trademark, just say it's, it's, um, 
you know, Yvonne's letters and envelopes. The PTO might come and say, um, you have to disclaim any exclusive right to use the word letters and envelopes because that's the name of the product. Well, you really, there's not, that's not a question, something you're going to fight. So you're just going to agree to that disclaimer. That doesn't add a lot of time. But what, uh, if, if there's a, if they say your trademark is confusingly similar to somebody else's, that requires a, essentially a legal brief, you know, uh, opposing that and trying to overcome that, then the process can be, you know, a year, year and a half before you're done. And if an opposition is filed, it could take it even longer. But assuming everything goes well, you're talking five to seven months, you know. Um, moving forward, I did want to talk to you just as a second about unregister mar uh, unregisterable marks. Um, primarily because some of them are actually funny. Um, the first one, which is one of my favorite trademarks in the world, is Bad Frog Beer up there. It's a beer company, and they, they tried to register, they actually registered this trademark, and I don't know how well you can see it, or if it's really clear to you, but the frog has his middle finger upraised, um, and uh, the, the Patent and Trademark Office has a uh, a, there's a clause in the law, Section 2A, which says, you know, immoral, deceptive, or scandalous marks cannot be registered. And so, of course, the examiner refused it because they felt it was immoral or deceptive. It went to appeal. And it went to the appeal in, in this, the U.S. court system is divided into circuits. This went to the Seventh Circuit, which is in Chicago, and it covers the Midwest. And the judge there is actually a, a brilliant, brilliant guy. And he wrote a long treatise essentially, on the origins of that symbol, tracing it back to ancient Greece. And, and he said it's been in common use by basically all of Western civilization for, you know, as long as there's been a Western civilization. And therefore, he, he ruled that it was not immoral, deceptive, or scandalous. Um, we have something going on right now. In, I don't know how many of you are football fans, American football fans, but we have the Washington Redskins where there's been a case where the, the use of the word Redskins was found um, to be uh, dis disparaging of, of India, of American Indians. And they canceled the trademark. It didn't mean they can't, they, they canceled the trademark registration. It didn't mean they couldn't use the trademark. It just meant they, the U.S. government wasn't required to you know, recognize it as a trademark. But a second case came along with a, a musical group called the Slants, which are all Asian guys, and they named themselves the slants and they were being ironic. And the slants is sort of a derogatory term for, Asian Amer for Asians. And they've taken their course to the Supreme Court. Uh, and so this whole question of whether or not the U.S. government has the right, or, you know, the right to prevent registration of these marks is now, in, is now in question. A whole section of law is in question. But that's why I refer to these marks. The other two marks are uh, the, the Shen... Uh, the, the Chien de Domaine de France, it's, ge it's, uh, uh, ge it's the, you know, it's geographically, it's a geographic. Appalachian of origin. Excuse me? Appalachian, Appalachian of origin. Thank yeah. you. It's an Appalachian of origin. And, you know, that was a question of whether or not that could be, that, that could be actually a trademark. And I'm just rustling through my little printout here because I wanted to um, talk about that just a little bit more. It, it's you can't register these sort of things. I mean, it's you know, it's it's referring to it's referring to this you know appellation of origin. It would be considered geographically descriptive, therefore not registrable. Uh, the mark bike. This was a Russian company, um, and it was the in, in uh, there's a joint stock company called Bike, and uh, B A I K. And uh, the, the bike was considered. The PTO said, well, B A I K was actually only a surname you know, someone's last name, and you can't register a surname, your family name, unless you can show that there's secondary, uh, unless you can show that it's acquired distinctiveness in the, mar in, in the marketplace. Well, here, the, 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 uh, they were able to argue and overcome a refusal based on that. And there was also an issue of whether bike had to do with Baikal, Lake Baikal, um, but they were, they, were, they were able to pass that all through and get it approved. But, you know, that was, um, uh, that was a Russian, I think bike is a vodka. And it, uh, that was an interesting case, I thought, at any rate. Um, in terms of what happens when you file an application, the, you, the substantive refusals are, you know, again, if a mark is, uh, there's a likelihood of confusion, if a mark is descriptive, um, if it's geographically descriptive. When you get a refusal like that, if you get a refusal like that, you want to consult with counsel. 
Um, I just had a case, a U.S. Co a clothing manufacturer here in the U.S. Guy just started up. <clears throat> he manufactures a line of urban, cl urban clothing. He got a refusal, and he, he actually thought through the response fairly well, but he didn't, you know, he, 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 he didn't refer, you know, you know what the exact, the, these are legal briefings. You need to have some case sites. You need to have, you, it needs to be argued a certain way with a certain kind of language. You want to have, you want to at least consult with counsel uh, before you file any kind of response. Um, in descriptiveness, um, you know, again, I talked about it, I'll talk about it again because I do think it's important. You want to have somebody assess whether or not there are responsive arguments available, and sometimes there are. Um, but if they're not, you can, and if the mark has been in use, you could amend, um, you know, to say that the mark has acquired distinctiveness. Another solution in the U.S., there are really two registers. There's the principal and the supplemental register. The supplemental register is reserved for marks that while not inherently distinctive, are capable of acquiring distinctiveness. And if you could get a supplemental register, you could use the R symbol, it's, people are on notice of your rights, and five years later you could come back and file a new application and get it registered on the principal register. But you have those options. But there are certain things to consider. Um, and when you're looking at likelihood of confusion, the first thing you look at, are there similar marks in use? Um, is there any way to distinguish the way the marks are sold through their channels of trade? Uh, is there, you know, uh, you know, you you want to you you want of course look to see if there's any other third parties out there uh, in an opposition lawsuit who can challenge you. Um, and one of the things you want to look at also is, do I need to? You really want to ask yourself, do I need to go through the, all, all this? And there are legal. There are good reasons to get a registration, but sometimes you have to ask, do I really need to? Sometimes it's possible you may see something out there that, as a practical matter. You know, just as a from a business perspective, you really know there's not going to be trouble. You know, I I knew um, I did a case not long ago with a Spanish company that designed uh, flooring products and uh, tiles, and there was a company in California just operating in a limited way in California and Arizona, in the west, you know, in the western part of the U.S., so doing uh, basically building these outdoor fireplaces using the same trademark. The trademark office wouldn't have anything, wouldn't allow our application. But as a practical matter, my client could use the mark. These guys were not going to come after my client. The products were really quite different. Um, but, you know, so what the PTO says, that just goes to registration. Then you have to ask yourself, well, can I use the mark anyway? And you have to look at the risks of being sued, really, in practical business terms. And that's when, you know, you want, you want to have a, a, a lawyer, you want to consult with somebody about it. Because as a business standpoint, you really, you know, from a business perspective, you really have to ask yourself what's practical and what's not. So we have a question based on that. Yeah. Uh, there is a company within our cohort. Uh, they provide an automated coaching for basic mistakes in holding presentations. So to improve your presentation skills. Uh -huh. And they are registered in the, the European Union and they provide services for U.S. customers, so they're looking at the U.S. market. They have uh, registered their IP for solutions in the EU and their home market, um, but they've also found that there's an existing U.S. patent from 2003 in educational and training services that roughly correspond to half of their service features. And so- A U.S. patent or a trademark? Um, a U.S. patent. That's a patent. Yeah, yeah. Their 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 question is about patents okay. here. Um, so their question is similar to what you're saying with trademark registration. Is you know what should they do? Um, should they you know to what extent do they run the risk of infringing? Um, do they prepare their own patent submission? Uh, do they or you know should they be prepared for litigation? So I think this opens up to a broader question of startups. Mm -hmm. In our cohort, there are startups. Um, everything that you've mentioned is good um, knowledge for them to, to be aware of. But you know, when you work with startups, what are some practical steps that they can take? You mentioned USPTO that search, right? But typically, what are the scenarios? And in this case, um, what could this company uh, think about? Well, this company could think about. Um, if they have, first of all, you're talking, if I, uh, I'm, I'm curious to know a little bit more about their patent. 
um, if it, cause it, it sounds like it's not a software patent, but it's a business, but it sounds like a business method patent. What was, I get, what, let me ask, what was patented? What exactly was patented in 2003? Yeah. Um, Rostislav, if you, if you'd like to actually, uh, join the conversation right now and, and discuss this, it may be helpful. We can unmute you right now if you'd like to ask. Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, you're there. Uh, basically, my question is caused because uh, I provided a link to some patent. It's an educational training system. Ah. They, it has a short annotation and the features uh, included and description of how it works. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in fact, uh, it covers 50% uh, of our functionality. Mm -hmm. It's a set of processes that are packed inside of this solution that could be put to the different interfaces uh, and different uh, architectural solutions. Right here. Mm -hmm. Uh, then the question arises, uh, so how should we deal with such uh, situation? Is it uh, a normal... Uh, <laughs> okay, yeah. Well, you know, the first thing, you know, is it's, always, it's always difficult to answer these questions on the fly. And I appreciate the question. I think you had, you had I, I'd seen a question from you, uh, which uh, Ivan had, had sent me earlier but you know the first thing you want to do is um, truthfully you want to have someone really assess the claim the, what, what's in that 2003 patent against what you're doing claim by claim um, just to see where yours is distinguished one of the things you know you want to be sure that you're not infringing that patent and you know so you, you know you want to get uh, you want to get someone to assess that because maybe, you know, this is a 2003 patent, which means it'll expire um, in 2020, um, I think, in 17 years. 17 years from the time it was uh, granted, if not uh, before then. Uh, but the, uh, you, want it, you do want to get an, you know, you want to get an opinion because you don't want to, you also want to see what else is out there. And you want to do a patent search because there may be a 2003 patent out there, but there may be other things out there. And you might know this off the top of your head. Are there other people offering, you know, doing things that seem similar to what's covered in that patent? But that's the slide. Yeah, yes. Uh, and and one, one more question. Is it the difference uh, between uh, who is the owner of the patent, uh, the institution such a university or the individual? Well, that when it goes to assessing risk, um, you want to know who you're dealing with. A university might be um, more vigilant than an individual, but sometimes individuals, you know, can be quite vigilant. And you know, they're it, but it, it, it's a question of how much resources do they have and things like that. You want to do a little bit of investigation to figure out. One of the things you want to look at is. For instance, is the person who is in this case in the patent that you sent us? I didn't. I didn't uh, look at look at it in detail. But it would, does it name an individual or or a university? Is, is the owner a, a, an individual or a university? It looks like a very generic type of patent. <laughs> Whatever the participant, it's an individual. It's an individual. Yeah. You know, there are two things there. You know, and you you have to assess the strain. You know, just because something's patented doesn't mean that it has, you know, that it has, um, that it's a strong patent. And also with this kind of patent, it, it strikes me, it, what it was granted in 2003 might not necessarily be granted now and in courts might not fare very well. Right. And so these are the sorts of things you have to assess. And, you know, and that you would really need, because this, this kind of patent, just a little you described to me, it strikes me off, you know, very <laughs> instinctively that it's really a question of whether or not it's even enforceable now under current law. But again, this is not everything I say here, and I should have said this at the very beginning, nothing I'm saying here is a legal opinion, and so you can't rely on it as such. And we, we would, you know, we or whoever you wanted to use would have to really look at this a little bit more closely. Have you gotten any legal advice on this yet? Have, have, you, have you talked to any, any lawyers, any U.S. lawyers or lawyers familiar with the U.S. law? About uh, not, this? not yet. <laughs> yeah. 
because you i mean you you um you you want to truthfully are you are you actively looking to get into the u.s market yes then you really do you really do want to talk to someone because you want to see you know one of the first questions is how how enforceable is this patent this 2000, 2003 patent it may not be you know and that's question number one and then then if it's not really that enforceable then you don't even have to worry and then in terms of what your patent offers you know if you wanted to actually get a patent it's, it's you know in, in the post in the in the post Alice world, it has to be um, in the post Alice world. These kind of patents are a bit harder to get because it sounds like a, biz a business method, uh, a business method patent more than anything else. They're definitely harder to get. But if there's something there, which I'll talk about later in this presentation, by the way, um, but if there's something there that is patentable, you might be able to design a patent that has claims that just go to that without necessarily, uh, you know, and, and finding a way to write around or, you know, design around the parts of the patent, the parts of the 2003 patent that are, are a problem for you. You know, but again, we would need to look at this in detail. It's, it's a little bit hard to talk to it, you know, off the, off the top of my head, you know, without having really set and studied it for a little bit. Yeah. Um, for the sake of time and not to infringe on the, the slides that you've prepared, I think it is a good time to discuss maybe some of the questions that have been fielded. Okay, how much time do we have? Um, well, it's uh, 9.50. Oh, we haven't? Oh, okay. I mean, we can take as much time as we need, but... Yeah. Um, uh, I guess I do, if I could just talk, I want one more point about what I was talking about with the refusals. And I know we want, I think it'd be better to go to your questions, but for technical refusals, there's small ones identification of goods, entity designation, mark description, things like that. Those can be uh, handled very easily, but you, you, you need to respond to them because if you don't, your application can be refused. That's a trademark. But why don't we go to questions if that's, if that's gonna be. Um, yeah, so we fielded some questions um, beforehand. I'm not sure yeah. how they're referenced in your slide or how you can draw them up. Yeah, they mo mostly had to deal with, um, uh, and I, I'm speeding through here. You, uh, you can. Uh, I, will these guys get copies of this? Or yeah, we can share this as well. Because uh, yeah. the um, uh, there's information here on copyrights and things like that. But I wanted to talk. A lot of what the questions are, are go to patents, uh, and I had added some things. But maybe you know, let me go through this really quick, and may, uh, maybe that would help. Um, but the bottom line is, I, and a couple of questions that you submitted beforehand dealt with Alice, and I think all of you realize that a Alice has really been a game changer for, for business, business method and software patents. And the question is really whether something is a patent eligible, is it a patent eligible concept or is it just an abstract idea? And if it's, if it's a abstract idea, does it have an inventive concept sufficient to transform that idea into a patent eligible application? Um, the, just statistically, and this is important for what you need to know, you know, 60 in, uh, in court cases with challenging software patents and business method patents, 65% of software patents have been invalidated. 78% of business method patents have been invalidated. Mm -hmm. The PTO has a covered business method review. 80% of those patents that are taken up by the, in the business method reviews are invalidated. Um, and it's, it's just, and the issuance of these software patents has become has sharply decreased. Um, and the biggest impact is in electronic, uh, electronic commerce inventions. Now, um, and I've, I've talked about the, uh, the test and it's up here and I, I know I want to get to your questions, but I just wanted to go very quickly through a couple of cases, but you know, there was, uh, you know, these are post Alice commerce that were, were software patents were upheld in this case. The, patent, the court said the patent was necessarily rooted in computer technology in order to overcome a specific problem, which had to do with retaining uh, website visitors. And that was approved. A couple of other cases uh, that are talked about, and you know, there, and I, I, I looked these up quickly before I came here, um, but there, uh, there was a claim, EnFish was a, a claims directed to fast searching of data and a computer database were upheld because they're directed to a specific improvement of the way computers operate. There was that inventive step, something actually happened. You know, it wasn't just an abstract, abstract concept. Again, Bascom Global was a case where the claims were directed to filtering internet content. That was held patent eligible. The, uh, MC, the Micro case, the, the Bandai, there was a, the claims were directed to generating automated lip synchronization and association of facial expressions for 3D animation. You know, basically the idea is to get the, the lips to move with the words. 
um, and that was held eligible because there was something that actually happened with it. Um, so th those are um, those are important things. So let me let me get to your questions because I think that would be uh, perhaps the, you know you, you clearly have them and I don't want to put them off. So go ahead. Um, I know that we had fielded a, a few questions and you maybe had some some reference to them and we have all of these available for you. Um, so and, and I know that you've also reviewed them. So we have a SaaS platform for businesses that they're looking at adaptive training and hands-on simulations. Um, they're wondering about business method software patent issued after the Alice case. And what kind of typical pat patent applications would there be in the education technology SaaS world? I would imagine that these are pretty sector agnostic, but at the same time, have there been any examples of even SaaS platforms that have um, gone under this. I actually looked. I didn't. I I didn't immediately find anything that was there, which isn't to say they're not there. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very specific question. I talked to my one of my patent colleagues about it who does software patents. He nothing jumped out at him either, which isn't to say they don't exist. And I think it falls under the broader umbrella of business method patents, where you know you're really talking about, uh, you know, if you're talking about a business method. You're not going to be any different than anybody else here, you know, in that who's who has a business method patent, and you're going to suffer suffer uh, under the post Alice, you know, the consequences of Alice. Uh, but that doesn't mean. I think this goes to a secondary question that was asked. It doesn't mean that the the what you have is not protectable. If you have code, uh, you know, your your software code, your source code is you could register that in the copyright office and you could submit a redacted copy so you could you know basically you put diagonal lines one inch one inch wide diagonal lines through through the first and the last 25 pages of the code um but you get a copyright in it so anyone who who copies your code in any way you would have a you would have a statutory grounds to go against them and that also having a registered copyright a gives you the right to sue in federal court B, it also makes you eligible for statutory damages. So it's important to do that. Also, your user... What if the code is able to be changed, though? Well, if the code is able... The, the standard is not identical in copyright law. The standard is substantial similarity. And so if there's... If, you know, if it's... if, if the, And you got to remember, too, the idea isn't protectable. You know, the, the simple idea that you're trying to do, uh, if, if it's simply an idea... You know, a certain if you in an abstract way of just you know teaching you know teaching students in a certain way, that's not protectable. What's protectable is how you get there, how you know how you do. Cosmetic changes, then you'd have a case. Um, if you done there, there are some old software cases dealing with this issue. But if uh, you, as I said in law school thirty years ago, but there, there are um, you would you, but that uh, you, that's the with, with with software patents in particular, with uh, software copyrights in particular, you know, you could certainly get to the same goal, but do it in a different way, and that you wouldn't be able to do anything against against against. But what you can also protect is your graphics, your user interface. You know, you have you're talking about applications basically, um, and graphics and all of these things. That you can, you know, teaching materials, brochures, all of that is protectable under copyright. So, if you're, for instance, if you're, a, if you're a software, if you have a software, you have a, a user interface. How you do the user interface is, um, you know, it's it's essentially an art. It's drawing. It's graphical work. It's a visual. It's a visual. Uh, it's a visual work. Those are protectable. And there are a lot of lot of websites that will, you know, to protect the look and feel of what they're doing, will register their copyrights. You don't want someone copying that. So you can register the copyright not just in the code, but also in the graphics and your user interfaces. You know how what 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 what's consumer facing, you know what people see, mm -hmm. and that's another way to do it. And a, uh, you know a third way, of course, is branding. Um, what well, branding doesn't get to the code, obviously, but you want to have a strong brand out there. But the fourth thing also, which I I talk about somewhere here, trade secrets. Um, you want to keep, you know, if you have your code out there, your source code and things like that, a, a, well, if your source code, you want to keep as much as you can secret. You want to keep it, you know, so only a limited number of your employees have access to it. 
you don't want it published, you know, you don't want it published out there in a newspaper, you know, or in a magazine. You, you want to make sure reasonable measures have been taken to keep the information secret. And so that's something, you know, in, uh, I was talking to my, my patent colleague about this just the other day, where a lot of, pat, you know, by the time the PTO gets done with, you know, reviewing a patent, they've often so limited the claims and, you know, cut it back so much that there's really not much there. And so you want to take your, have, there are certain things that are in, under your control, not the least of which is the trade secret, keeping things secret. You know, if you have a certain way of doing things, just make sure you keep it to yourself and the few trusted employees you have, your developers, make sure they sign non-disclosure agreements, things like that. I kind of skipped over these slides about the importance of doing that. But when you're working your, your software in the software world, uh, you guys all, you know, work, you know, you often remotely with people from other countries sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, and you want to make sure, you know, it's more than just a slap on the back and a handshake. You want to have something in writing. If someone's developing a segment of code for you, you want them to agree in writing that what they're doing for you is a work made for hire. So it, there's no question about ownership. And those are like one paragraph agreements. I mean, you know, I, they're, they're very simple agreements, but they're very, they're very clear on, the fact that the contractor does not own the rights. I have seen too many cases come in where people did not have these agreements. And under law, I mean, under law, a writing is required. Under the, it's, it's in statute and in the Copyright Act. So if something's not, if something's not in writing, it's not a work made. If you don't have an agreement, a written agreement, it's not a work made for hire. Make sure you have those agreements. But and this all goes to trade secrets, protecting what you have. Is this helpful? I, you know, one, one thing about doing a, a um, a, a, a presentation like this is like I can't see your faces, so I don't know if I'm resonating. He says thanks so much for clarifying this. That um, it, it seems like a number of these pat patents that they're looking at may be invalidated because they're kind of noticing these strange patents that are coming up within their yeah. industry, uh -huh. um, particularly related to SAS. And there was a comment here that SAS code is usually a closed source. Yeah. So it's helpful to know that because there's not many patents out there for SAS, it might be worth considering patenting at a, at a later stage. And obviously this conversation is helping to navigate them to think more about trademark. Yeah, and one policy. thing also is to know with your patent, if you're out there and your stuff is published, you, you only have a year. If something's out there for more than a year, you can't get a patent, and you've been using it for more than a year, you can't submit a patent on the first day of the second year, you know, with everything after the first year, it's just simply not patent eligible anymore. So, and you can, uh, you know, and this is why I encourage you to get an, an assessment, get an opinion yeah. on it. Uh, because, you know, I'm, it's hard to do here off the, you know, off the cuff. Sure. And it needs some study. You know, you need someone to give it a considered opinion. And if I know, if I have any sense of, of who I'm dealing with, of, of you guys, uh, and just from the questions I got, uh, I got, from uh, that you sent in, you're all very well informed, and you you know understand U.S. law, and you know at least you know uh, to the extent you need to. So you know what you're dealing with. I mean, I think I, I just heard uh, Adrian say that you you know you you you've been looking at some of these patents, and in, in the and a lot of them right now they can they I suspect a lot of them can be invalidated, and that's something you just want to have somebody look at. And you want to confirm that because you don't want to just waltz into the U.S. market and find yourself being sued. Yeah, that's it. That's it. There was another sort of general question, too, about patent trolls and how much really they need to mm. worry about that. Yeah. That is um, – I have um, – I have a slide. Or I thought I had a slide in here about patent trolls. But I, I did want to talk about that. Oh, watch out for trolls. Um, the uh, – with patent trolls – I was in a case not long ago where there was a, a company uh, they bought. It was a company that they didn't invent anything. They simply bought a patent. They bought a portfolio of patents. One of them had to deal with some text messaging code, SMS code, short messaging code, five lines of code. And the, the, that code was being distributed by a vendor who, you know, was basically provided consulting services to different businesses. My clients were radio broadcasters and radio stations. They often have contests and things where they use text messaging, you know, text us at so-and-so and you'll win, you know, a lunch tray or something. Um, and the, uh, we got this letter and my client, a couple of my, we got it from the same guy, uh, uh, 
I had I, the company I think was called TMS. I have it in a or in one of my slides way back. I won't bother going back to it. But the company um, was basically suing radio stations for using software code. They were trolls, and they were using software code provided by a vendor who who provided the service. But rather than go after the vendor, they were going after. They were trying to shake down the radio stations, who were generally part of large corporate entities like CBS Radio or iHeart Radio, which used to be Clear Channel or people like that. And there was a lot of, you know, consensus. People talked about uh, common defense because the guy really didn't have, you know, the patent wasn't that strong. And what happened was someone out in Oregon, one of the, one of the people who he sent that letter to filed uh, what they called a declaratory judgment. That's when, when someone's, someone threatens to sue you. And they haven't done it yet. If there's a really threat to sue you, you could you could go to the court in a preemptive move, and force them and ask the court to say you basically rule there's no infringement. But you you have the incentive and you put them back on their heels. That's what they did and they won with patent trolls. And it's not just patent trolls, by the way. It's also copyright trolls. And say you know if you're using, if for instance you've designed software, maybe you work with someone and they found a photograph on the internet, and suddenly you get a demand letter from a photographer who claims it's his. Um, you you just have to carefully assess the source who's sending it to you and, and talk to other people in the industry because sometimes when there's a troll out there lots of people in the industry are going to be getting getting uh love notes from this guy and a, mm. a love note of course being a demand letter and the uh you just need to carefully assess whether or not you want to respond there are i could tell you frankly as a practitioner there are uh i have a case uh, another radio station used a photograph but we I wasn't clear because I could, the, there was just some funny things wrong with the letter, not the least of which it wasn't signed by an individual attorney. Um, it was sort of a block letter. You know, it was a form. It was a template. It, it was nothing particularly mm. except for one paragraph. There was nothing in it specifically about what we, we had done. And I just, you know, and I basically sat with my client who was, you know, a broadcaster. And we said, if they're serious, they're going to write us back. So let's just see if they come back. Mm -hmm. And well, a year later, they came back with the same letter, not referring to the first letter. Mm. And they came, they came back. And we said, well, you know, truthfully, you know, let them get serious. If they want to, if they, if they, if they want to talk to us initially, and I actually called them at one point and uh, asked for a response. They just didn't. They were just trolling, and they were looking to get a quick settlement for their client. They had no intention of suing. So the message there is, uh, don't worry about patent trolls. No, that's but, not the message. But, but to get armed with legal counsel so that you know that when, yeah. when they strike, you have enough. Yeah, uh, wherewithal and enough resources. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's it's you know not to stress too much about it, but right. respond or get get advice of counsel when you get a letter, so you can you can understand what you're you're responding to. Because the one thing you don't want to have happen is you want to you don't want to ignore something, and then have, suddenly find yourself in court. You know that's just that's never right. never ends well. So it's not like you don't ignore the trolls, but you assess them really carefully before and consider really carefully how to respond. Uh, a number of the questions that came to us before are mainly to do with resources and step-by-step -step guides. Obviously, the resources that are mentioned in your presentation will share the presentation. Uh, the USPTO is the first way to go. Um, any additional resources for startups? Uh, it looks like the questions are mainly about, you know, we need a step-by-step -step guide was one. Um, you know, we're very interested in sort of case studies, you know, specifically related to software. Uh, what's out there? Well, they're, um, they're in, t well, in terms of guides, you know, for startups, it, you know, it, it, are you, you know, are you talking about the business side of it or the IP side of it? The IP side of it. The IP yeah. side of it. Um, there are, there are guides. I mean, you know, there are, um, uh, you know, and they're really, truthfully, a lot of it goes to what I've talked to uh, in, in this presentation. I could certainly put something together, you know, as well. Um, but just, you know, you want to do, you want to talk about your branding, that, you know, you want to make sure you have a brand that's, that's protectable. Um, the next thing you want to do is look at your graphics, your software guys. So you want to look at your code and you want to think about protecting copyright protection is really cheap. It's not a big deal. It's like $55 to register a copyright. Um, uh, at the, and I, on, on my slides, I actually provide the uh, link to the uh, copyright office. You can file electronically. You you have to register with the copyright office, and you can file electronically. Can you reference that? And then which which one is it? Oh, my slide. Yeah, 
it's uh let me go back sorry guys um yeah i got it it's, uh uh oh i didn't even talk to you about the dmca by the way which i need to do um but the um yeah the, uh, it says a slide 21 uh there's a uh 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 or no it's not. oh no there it is yeah the um the, the application can be filed at uh it, it's uh, it's the fourth, third, third dot point there, but it's it's uh, register and uh, it's co copyright off copyright www.copyright.gov forward slash register, and you should be able and you'll be able to get the uh, you get to the form and everything you need there, and uh, the uh, fees are thirty three to thirty fifty five dollars. And again, if you're if you're doing source code, you want to redact it. Um, and I, I, what I do is I have a, for the first, and, you know, feel free to email me and I, I could very quickly tell you what to do. You know, it's nothing I would, ch I would charge for, but it's, um, you want to redact with a, a diagonal lines across the page, one, the black lines, one inch wide, one separation between them. And, and then you, you have to provide a statement uh, to them that you're submitting a redacted copy to protect trade secrets. Um, and that's, you know, that's what, if you were doing the copyright ups, that's what you would do. But I, I do want to point that out to you, but is it that, in, uh, in that, that's sort of one, one point. And so we're talking about the copyrights, also the graphics, you know, do the same thing. Um, and then the patents again, the patent side, it's, you know, you want to do a patent search. You want to, you want to, you know, talk to counsel if you're already out there and you're using something, you want to get an opinion. Uh, it's important that you do this because you can't just waltz into a market and you know make yourself vulnerable to uh, to a law lawsuit. Um, but it's important to do this upfront work. A patent search, you know, just a, pa a quick patent search doesn't cost that much. An opinion, of course, costs a bit more, but it's important to get that opinion if you think there's a question there. Um, and the uh, and then you have to consider whether or not it's worth actually filing a patent for patent. Or whether or not you could just go ahead and use without bothering with that. And also for all of our uh, companies in our in our group, we'll be able to provide some resources on searching for patents. Uh, we have some of this information that actually the U.S. Patent and Trade Office has has collected, so we'll be able to provide that. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, I think you're right. It is a conversation. It's asking the right questions and also uh, talking to legal counsel. But you know, it, it, it's important. Like you know, the patent. You know, the patent office also. By the way, you can search patents too. And the, you know, and patents actually are much because patents are really federal question. There's no common law patent. There's a you know, there's there's trade secret, but there's no common law patent law. That there's in trademark law. So when you get on the the USPTO website for patents, you could search patent applications and patent registrations. Bearing in mind that patent applications aren't published for eighteen months. But you could certainly get us to do a patent search and see what's out there, what's been approved, and things like that. And that's, again, US, uh, www.uspto.gov. Click on patents, and it'll take you right there. We also have a question here about some costs associated with, um, kind of with startups. I mean, obviously, lots of startups are cash-strapped. Yeah. And they want to know a basic kind of framework for a professional tech review and patent search. Again, I would say first that you should get the resources on your own to do Google searches, Google patent searches and USPTO searches. But in terms of packages, what is a typical offering for a startup, um, including some professional tech review and legal counsel? You know, it depends. I mean, my, my firm, I, I work in a, a smaller boutique. Uh, and we're all from bigger firms, but we, we did this in order to cut our overhead. So, you know, you could, you could be spending 800 bucks an hour, you could be spending 300 bucks an hour, but you know, packages for a patent search, you know, the, if you were to talk about doing a patent search without an opinion, you know, just getting relevant records for you, you're talking maybe a thousand, fifteen hundred bucks. If you need an opinion on top of it, there's going to be, it's going to be a couple thousand dollars more um, to do a patent application you know, just a, over the course of several, over the course of maybe a year, a year and a half, you could easily spend $10,000, maybe a little bit, maybe a little bit less, depending on the nature of the patent, just because the patent office generally will kick back a patent application and ask for, you know, get issue and reject some of the claims and you have to go back and forth responding to that. Um, 
so you know it could it, it, it's hard to give an estimate because patents it's a case by case thing some simply require more attention than others sometimes you get lucky i mean trademarks for uh, trademarks generally i when i estimate for trademarks assuming a one class application there's an additional official fee for each extra class but assuming one class application i generally give an estimate of about thirteen hundred dollars from filing for a use-based application or based on a foreign registration maybe twelve to thirteen hundred dollars for uh to get you from application to registration but sometimes it's less sometimes a pto never even i never hear from them and suddenly i get a registration certificate but then you're just talking maybe you know, at the end of the day, maybe 900 bucks or a thousand bucks, you know, it just depends on how, you know, how, how good the PTO is, uh, you know, and how much trouble we have with the PTO. Um, but, you know, for patents particularly, um, with the trademarks, you know, assuming there's no substantive objections, trademarks could cost you 1300 bucks or so, maybe a little bit less. Patents, you know, it's hard to give you an estimate, but, you know, if you do it incrementally, you're talking a, a search without an opinion, maybe 1500 bucks. And then a, 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 if you want an opinion, factor in a, a, you know, a few thousand dollars more, maybe, maybe less, depending on what, you know, what's in the search. It just depends. You know, I hate to say mm -hmm. that. I hate to sound like a lawyer. I, I really do. Right. But unfortunately, it just depends on what's there. Some things require more work than others. Um, and then if you're talking about a patent application, then, you know, because you have to draft claims there's a lot that's involved. And if you, you know, if you have a Russian, if you're filing under this patent cooperation treaty, if you filed in Russia, um, say, I mean, I don't know for the, for uh, Rastislav, you were taught, you know, you, if you have a patent in Russia, and you may be able to uh, f extend, you know, file under the, patent, the Paris cooperation treaty and PCT application or patent cooperation treaty. And through that, uh, submit an application in the U.S., which could cut cut some of your costs, but you're still going to need a U.S. attorney at some point. I mean, there are just ways to do it, and it's it's so case by case. You know, it's not it's not like you know getting an estimate to paint your house. I mean, right. it, I, I wish it was. I, I truly wish it was, but it's hard. It's just hard to nail it down altogether. What stage typically do startups protect their IP? Um, too late. Too late. Yeah. <laughs> I mean. That is an important question in terms of resources. So yeah. a number of our guys, they've bootstrapped products they're selling in the market. Um, here in the United States, what's been your experience? So they typically post seed, angel investment, uh, kind of pre-Series A. At what stage do they start really getting serious about IP? Well, I know if they're looking at like Series A investment, you know, they're looking at getting investors in. A lot of them... A lot of investors want to see um, a lot of investors want to see a patent application filed, even if it's a provisional application. I didn't even mention provisionals, but you can file on the basis of you know an outline of your claim. You could file a provisional application, which is you know cheap. You know it's a thousand bucks or so maybe, but it uh, it's just a provisional application that gives you a year gives you a year it buys you a year to submit a formal full fat patent application. Um, but a lot of investors want to see that you're serious and they see you're serious by seeing that you filed an application that you filed something. Mm -hmm. So the patent side of things, uh, you, they do that up front for branding. Cause sometimes the patent, you know, the patent is sort of first, it's the, it's the invention that you're trying to protect. The next thing is branding. I mean, if you, if you're serious about a brand, if you if you know that you've actually chosen a brand and you're going to market this thing under a certain brand and you want to have, you, you want to get, uh, draw uh, draw your line in the sand so that you know you have the rights you want to get your trademark application in as quickly as possible um you know that's sort of the order i would go copyrights um you know is also there you know it, it's probably i mean it's se again secondary to patents but if you want to do the source code you want to you want to get a copyright for that there are uh or some graphics you want to get that protected too but you want to do it up front. You don't want to do it after you have a problem. You don't want to do it if, say, say someone, say, this happens a lot. Say a guy who you work with, an errant employee, decides to steal your stuff and come out with the same product uh, or same design or steals your designs. You don't want to have to backfill and get your copyright registration and get your trademark in to you know, sue these guys. You want to have the rights up front because among other things, you got to remember, it's not only being able to sue somebody, it's, it's giving everybody notice that you're serious and that you have rights in this thing. 
So if someone wants to go and use your trademark, well, hell, you have an application and, or better yet, a registration already. You're going to have the rights to act quickly and you're not going to have to backfill and you're not going to have to go through arguments of who used it first. And especially if you didn't have a work for hire agreement, which I talked to uh, here a little bit, works covered businesses, uh, copyright international copper come. Oh, indeed, by fair use. Where is it? Um, but the work made for hire was slide 28. Um, prepare, you know, you have to have these work made for hire agreements. You do not want to have your employees stealing your stuff or the guys you're working with. If you're contracting with someone in India or, you know, or Moldavia or someplace else, you know, you, or Moldova or someplace like that, you just simply don't want to have, uh, leave it to good faith, you know, just because, you know, a slap on the back that they're not going to steal your stuff. You want to raise a good it. point. There's probably greater likelihood that a employee would steal a code rather than an investor. Yeah. Because investors really work by a code of ethics. Mm -hmm. Investors really have reputation that they're, they want to make sure, investors always want to make sure that your intellectual property is protected. They're not in the business of trying to take it. Yep. Well, um, we are at 1022. Uh, we do have a little bit of time if there are any other questions. I know. Uh, IP is a huge, huge um, topic. Um, so, you know, many of them, uh, uh, the startups in our group, they have plenty of questions. We are you know, more than happy to answer them as we go throughout this program, but did want to take some additional time in the, in the time that we have to answer any other questions that you may have. Uh, there's, a, there's a question here about lawyers taking equity. Um, apparently, this happens in Ukraine. I would imagine that's not the case in the United States. Well, you know, uh, there is, um, there is, uh, oh, I managed to screw this up, didn't I? Uh, but there is a, uh, uh, I'm trying to get to, back to my slideshow. There I am. Okay. Okay. Uh, there. Okay. There is a, uh, some, some law firms do that where they'll, they'll take, uh, if they don't take equity, they'll take, you know, they'll say, we'll give you a certain set of, you know, you know, we'll do a certain package of work for you for free up front. But then they claim, you know, a certain, then the, the uh, bargain is that you then give them a percentage of everything you own for a certain amount of time. Um, there are, I, I've always felt personally that there's a problem with having equity in a client because it affects, as a lawyer, ethically, it seems to me, it affects your ability to, to provide the best advice because your interests are now overlapping with the, your, your, your pecuniary, your financial interests are now overlapping with the client. And um, that always seemed to be a problem. Having said that, people do it. And I recognize, I recognize, that's, uh, I recognize that that's been, uh, that's been, that does get done. Uh, but I, I always saw it as, I always see it as sort of problematic um, it, it just because it, you know, what do you do? You know, we're, we're, you're making arguments if someone's charging you with infringement, you're making you or if, if you're even enforcing against someone, maybe you'll be inclined to enforce even when there's not a client, you know, just, there are too many, you, it's, there are too many ethical dilemmas there and lawyers, notwithstanding our reputation, we do have to be concerned with, with ethics and things like that. So, but it is, having said that, the answer to your question, yes, it is done. I, I do, I do know that that's done. And I do, but I also know that there are other ways to deal with that. So client, you know, you know, to postpone payments for a certain amount of time to, to, you know, give early deals for startups because you're looking, again, you're looking to build relationships with companies and help them out so you could do some things up front for less, you know, with the understanding that, you know, the normal rates will apply moving forward once the company gets on its feet and things like that. But you're looking to build relationships. I mean, I, that's why I do this work, basically. That answer your question? I hope. I think it does. Okay. Well, we want to thank you, Luke, for um, all of your time uh, that you've offered to us today. Um, all of this material will be available through our Trello um, site, and uh, we will also work on our end to provide some additional resources to all of you. So thank you all for attending. Mm -hmm. And, and um, I, I just was able to the money, and I, I wanted to close with a cartoon, which is um, uh, written by a, a childhood friend of mine who's a, a cartoonist and who publishes um, uh, and I have, co I have permission to use this copyright, but it's this moment of revelation now that everything should be clear for you. There's a cartoon, I don't know how clearly you could see it, but of two bears in a campsite 
a ruined campsite. Clearly, they've eaten eaten the people in it and destroyed the campsite. And now they're sipping wine very casually. And they say, I finally remembered. Red with uh, red with hunter, white with fisherman. I think it's Russian. It's Yakanet Zapaminayos so So I'll leave that moment of revelation with you, and uh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.